Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting inside us. We cannot contain your love will surely combine us like radiant fires singing your name oh god mercy sweet love of mine i have surrendered Welcome to Fort McLeod Alliance this morning. We are going to uh, continue to worship through song. I'm going to invite you to stand for those of us who are here this morning. Lift it 
people who are unable to make it that might be dealing with illness or they might be dealing with loss or something. And in this challenging time of separation, uh, uh, Satan uses so many things to divide, to separate, and to, to keep people from the care, the comfort, and the uh, encouragement that they need. We just want to pray that uh, as we're challenged with that right now, that we would find ways to reach out to those people who are hurting through loss, illness, whatever the case may be, uh, just mental issues, depression. You would be with them. You know the you know their needs, and and we we just want to reach out to them through prayer and however we can to just uh, encourage them. If they're online this morning, just know that you have a group of people praying for you. We just also want to pray that as you speak to us this morning, we want to set all distractions aside. We want to take what we can from here and out into our community, and we just want to be the light for you, and we just want to be your presence uh, through the power that you. Uh, use through us. We commit all the aspects of the service to, the, to, uh, to your honor and glory this morning. We pray it in your precious name. Amen. I'm going to invite you, as we often do, just to give a, a nod. And uh, don't be afraid. Shout out. We cannot actually shake hands and intermingle. But uh, you know what? It's a word of encouragement regardless. If you're out there online, feel free to take your time with your technology right now to encourage one another. Do that. That's what uh, we want to take advantage of that. Encourage those around us, family, friends, that you might not be seeing right now or uh, in your midst this morning through your small groups. Good morning. Filled with your glory, Lord, angels and men adore. Creation longs for what's in store. May you be honored and glorified, exalted and lifted high. Here at your feet I lay my life. In my heart, in my heart, there's a fire burning, a passion deep within my soul, not slowing down, not growing cold. An unquenchable flame that keeps burning brighter, a love that's blazing like the sun for who you are and what you've done. And as the fire keeps raging on, so your praise becomes my song. The whole earth is filled with your glory, Lord. Angels and men adore. Creation longs for what's in store. Exalted and lifted high, clear and clear, I lay my life. From the ends of the earth to the heights of heaven, your glory, Lord, is far. of the sea. 
For the spirit of God gave for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid but gives us power love and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me his prisoner. Rather join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross that you lay down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me
this isn't failing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross that you lay down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for I sing for all that you've done for me. Then 
sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art. Please be seated. Don't have a pile for you this morning. We've got uh, a few things going on com coming up. We have our, uh, you can read it in your bulletins. And if you don't have your bulletins this morning, which I don't, uh, it is available online to you as well. Uh, you can go online, see what's happening, and check into your bulletins. There's ministries going on. We have the, uh, the uh, of some programs that we've con got coming up um, for fall that we will be implementing for the, uh, for the young kids, and they've got some strategic things planned for this time through our, our challenging times of separation and requirements that we are trying to keep in tune with and, and guideline, but uh, uh, keep in mind for those things if you've got young families or are interested in coming. We do right now have a family room set up up there, uh, up in our, our uh, uh, just a, um, uh, what do you call that? It's, it's a room up there. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a great space. We've got tables. We've got uh, the separation. So as families with young kids, they have their activities. They have things going on. It's a, it's a good time, and, and we have a live feed up there. So they're, they're part of our, our environment here, but uh, they have their spot there, which is a, a great way to, to reach out to our, our young families as well. Um, we want to keep praying for Pastor Kevin as well. He's uh, on vacation, well-deserved vacation for the next couple weeks here. So if you need anything, uh, feel free uh, between Tuesday uh, through Thursday, you can reach the, uh, the office here. Uh, or if there's somebody else you want to contact, any one of us, feel free to do that in, uh, in the absence of anybody who might be in the office uh, for the next little bit here. Uh, there are, uh, we do have our annual meeting coming up, our, our general uh, meeting. That will be in on September the 17th, I believe. Uh, so uh, we have ministry leads that are out there doing their reports. We encourage you to get those in uh, by the end of August, please, uh, just so that that can be built into the minutes for the annual meeting. So the, if, you, if you're in, in that uh, leadership role, please just uh, fill out your, your reports and, and we can get that in. Uh, as, as always, we want to thank you for your consistent giving through a challenging time. Uh, there's a box in the back here that we're using for that offering, and there's all, also some, some other ways that you can give through the, uh, the uh, online or, or the, uh, the, uh, the thing that we have set up in the back here. So uh, we do thank you for that, and we encourage you, to, uh, just as we've changed things, those, that's, uh, that's how we're operating this as well. Um, I feel like I'm forgetting something, but I forgot the... Uh, we have, a, uh, we have a church picnic coming up. That'll be August 30th. Um, we're going to have that out at our farm. So if uh, we will have the directions out to you and things, uh, obviously we're not going to be doing just a communal cookout kind of a deal. We encourage you to bring your food and however we will need to do that. But we're just going to get together. We're going to have a really good time. Uh, trying to, still trying to figure out how to do a three-legged race with the uh, challenges we have, but we'll, <laughs> we'll do something. We'll, we'll, we we'll just want to get together and enjoy each other outside of the church uh, here and just have a great time together. Uh, we'll give you more details, directions as that time approaches as well. Um, uh, right now, I, that's all I can think of, so we're going to actually continue to worship. Uh, there are, again, kids, if you need your activity centers, there, there are some in the foyer here. And we, uh, we encourage you to do that, and you can go upstairs or you can do it in your seats here with your family. So if that uh, pertains to you as young families, we encourage you to do that right now. Uh, let's just bow in a word of prayer before we continue, please. Loving God, as we prayed, we just thank you so much for an opportunity we have to gather here. Uh, without persecution, we know that there are many places that our people are working that are uh, facing a stronger persecution than, than uh, just this simple uh, separation or whatever that uh, that we're encouraged with. We want to pray for their diligence as they they actually diligently meet and uh, the importance of doing that. We just pray for their strength and endurance through that. We, uh, we just pray that as they go through their challenging times that it would be uh, 
that your power would uplift them and keep them going strong. We uh, pray for all of the aspects of the service, the young people, the, the vacation times that are happening. We pray for the programs that are coming up this fall. We pray that as we strategically work around those things, that they would have a, a large impact, that it wouldn't uh, minimize as, the, uh, as Satan would love us to do. Uh, we just pray that we would find ways to be largely impactful as it drives uh, so many things down right now. We just pray that we would continue strong and, uh, and, and that would be evident to, to us and our communities. Again, as we prayed, we just pray for everybody in this congregation, everybody that's come through these doors, that you would speak to them this morning, that you would uplift them, and as we go forward from here, that you would just uh, use us, encourage us, and fill our tanks here for this week. And we pray it in your precious name. Amen. And I invite you to stand as we continue to worship this morning. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road. There's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Well, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name.
to read Mark 5, verses 21 to 34. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people gather, you see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. that will pardon and cleanse within grace grace god's grace grace that is greater than all our sin marvelous grace of our loving god Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. That is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this morning?
time we're going to invite uh, Brent Bruce to come up and give us the word this morning. Wow, what a joy it is to be back In the house of the Lord. It's uh, been a long time. Actually, uh, this is the first, uh, yeah, first Sunday that we've been back in church since, uh, since COVID and everything's been going on. I mean, I've been in the building for some youth stuff, but... Uh, there's just, there's something special about uh, gathering with our brothers and sisters uh, in the house of the Lord. We just got back from holidays last night. Uh, we were in the mountains for a week, and whew, it was good. Uh, it was it was refreshing. Uh, and it was just enjoyable to spend time with family and, you know, to get out of the house because, like I said, COVID's been keeping us all 
you know, for the most part inside and until recently, and uh, it was just a good time. You know, we actually, we came home though last night, and uh, I ended up finding out that someone had actually gone through our car while we were gone. Uh, they didn't take the Christian stuff, unfortunately. Uh, they did take my Toyota manual, not sure why, why they would want that, um, but whatever. I left it unlocked, and uh, that's what happened. So, today, uh, let, let's start in prayer. Father God, I just thank you so much for all that you've done for us. I thank you that we can just come here and gather um, together. Lord, I just pray that today would be all about you, or that you would uh, speak from your word, uh, truth, and that, Lord, we might have a better understanding of your grace and what that means to us as your children. Amen. Well, we see formulas every day. Brilliant mathematicians and scientists using numbers and formulas to determine a specific and reliable outcome. Formulas, they often come in two formats. Mathematical, or a list of ingredients to create something. Colonel Sanders, he's been trying to protect his secret of 11 herbs and spices for many years. And apparently, the recipe leaked online. But you'll never make it the same. No matter what you think that recipe is, it's never going to taste like KFC until you have to make that mad dash to the bathroom because it's hit your guts. And you get a Cineplex story, which we'll leave that for another day. This, this whole week, like I said, we were in Chilliwack for most of it at this beautiful Airbnb uh, mountain scene behind. And every time I turned and looked at the TV, this award, Academy Award winning, critically acclaimed movie was constantly playing. You might have heard of it. It's called the SpongeBob movie. Actually, not just the SpongeBob movie, but Sponge Out of Water. Okay? So literally, this was on like 15 times while we were on holidays. It just every time I turned, it's on the TV. And Lucas, our three-year-old, for some reason got this fascination with the movie. And I know you're sitting here judging me saying you're letting your three-year-old watch SpongeBob. Well, guess what? I got a sermon illustration out of it, so I think it was God-ordained, okay? So we're watching the movie, and, and I don't know if you've seen it or not, but there's this character called Plankton, and I didn't watch the whole thing, but I got the gist of it, and, and of course I Googled it. Uh, so Plankton is like trying to steal the secret formula of Krabby Patty's burger recipe, okay? Um, and Mr. Crab will have nothing to do with it. Okay, Mr. Crab has protected this formula. It's been in a vault. He wants no one to touch it. So Plankton's trying to get this, and then it actually turns out that uh, Burger Beard, okay, he's the one who's actually after the formula, and, he's, and, and then it goes on and on. I didn't watch the ending, and I'm sure I'm not missing out on a whole lot. Um, but many movies have based their plot around protecting or stealing a secret formula or recipe. A true favorite movie of mine is Back to the Future, okay? And that's just like my era, that's what I, I grew up checking out this amazing DeLorean that could travel through time. And when it enters the screen for the first time in 1985, Marty McFly and Doc are testing it. Doc gets shot over stealing some plutonium, and Marty jumps into the time machine, into the DeLorean to get away from everything that's happening, and he travels back to 1955. Now, the 1955 Doc Emmett is watching the video from 1985 with Marty, and he sees the secret formula. And his reaction is 1.21 gigawatts of electricity, right? 1.21 gigawatts? Great Scott! What could I have been thinking? The only thing that could produce that kind of electricity is a lightning bolt. But we never know where or when it's going to strike. And Marty McFly 
in his calmness, says, we do now, Doc, because he knew that the lightning was going to strike the clock tower. All of us that grew up around the same time I did loved the DeLorean. And the secret recipe was that the DeLorean needed to reach a speed of 88 kilometers while the electricity hit and passed through the flex capacitor to then allow you to travel back in time. I'm still waiting for these things to hit the market, and I hope it's soon. And today I want us to travel back in time, at least in our minds, and make a stop in Rome prison, where the Apostle Paul is writing the book of Ephesians. Here we stop at a well-known piece of scripture, per perhaps too well-known, because there's times that we'll skip over the verses of our faith, the verses that have so much meaning and, and are fundamental to what we believe, we end up skipping over them because they become all too common or usual for us. I remember growing up in the Awana programs uh, between grade or kindergarten to grade 12, and part of this was uh, we, we learned how to memorize verses from the Bible. Um, that was kind of the main goal of Awana. So that one day I would grow up and be this incredible scholar with accolade. Okay, actually, you know what? I did it for the free week at camp because if you finished your book, you got to go to camp for a week. And that was incentive enough for me. But there's some standalone verses in the Bible that we can read and, and have full truth to them. You don't have to turn to Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. In fact, if you have a bulletin, it's, it's on the front of the bulletin. And that's where we're going to spend the first part of our time today. And in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. So it starts with, for it is, and, and in true Paul fashion, he makes a strong statement. He leaves nothing to be debated. In other words, Paul is saying, this is how it is. This is how it is. And then he adds two words. For it is, by grace. Well, what is grace? Grace. We're going to look at God's grace in a minute, but what about grace in general? Grace can be described as unmerited favor, something that we, we get when we are undeserving. And as believers, we, we ought to show grace in every aspect of our lives to everyone that we encounter, especially if you're here this morning as one who has experienced God's grace. The natural progression from that is to extend grace to others. We all like it when we have grace shown to us, don't we? I mean, especially when it is unmerited, such as us being in the wrong. I remember this time when I was in the wrong, which is like every day, probably, if you ask my wife. Um, but this was particularly two years ago. And our neighbor said that we could borrow their very expensive, very new GMC Yukon to take on a trip that we were making to Chicago. The whole family was going, and I had this check in my mind, and I was like, oh, and I talked to Ashley, and I'm like, what if something happens? Like, this is somebody's, like, vehicle, and then I'm like, oh, but there's so much more space, and it's just, so we took it, and we made the journey. And we ended up getting to, I can't remember if it was right around Chicago, but it was, it was in the States. And when we're in the States, we're all about trying new foods. Okay, we're all about checking out the restaurants that they have in the States that we don't have here. And that's just, you know, part of something that we love to do. Now, I need to back up a sec, because if you've ever been on a trip with the Bruce A's, 
you're in for an experience, okay? When, when people are telling you every day that your family should have its own YouTube channel, we're probably not living life ordinarily. So one of the places we like to eat is the Texas Roadhouse, okay? And maybe some of you have been there. It's a, an amazing place to eat. And it had been a full day of traveling, and I was just done. I was like, get me somewhere. Let me stuff my face with some food from the States. I love Texas Roadhouse. And Google Maps got us there. So I'm pulling into the parking lot. I'm excited. I'm like, the kids are screaming. We're like, oh, let's go eat. Ah. And I fail to maneuver the vehicle. And boom, I hit this car that's parked in a parking spot. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I, uh, this was my fear. I've, we're in somebody else's vehicle. We're, we're in Texas Roadhouse, which is like redneck capital. And, and people in this state carry guns. Like, what, what are we, what's happening right now? So I think to myself, you know, maybe, maybe what we can do is we can just leave a note and we'll just go down the road to IHOP and have ourselves some eggs and that'll be that. They can call us when they get the note. And I'd like to say that it was my conscience that said, no, no, you need to go find out who owns this. It was my drive to eat at Texas Roadhouse. So we go inside and it's packed. (coughs) Excuse me. It's packed in there. And I'm looking around and I'm like, how are we gonna find out who drives this vehicle? And then I see the waitresses, and they have, um, they have a PA system. So I'm like, hey, you know what? Why don't we just get them to announce the, you know, the vehicle, and then maybe the person will come forward? And I'm like, yeah, that's the best idea. So the lady gets on. She's like, would the driver of a Ford Bronco please come to the front area of the restaurant? I'm thinking to myself, oh, man, if this guy is like a 400-pound steroid-using linebacker, I'm in trouble, okay? And I'm worried. I'm worried that I don't know what to expect. I don't know what this guy is going to respond with. Nobody comes forward. So she's like, would the driver of a Ford Bronco license plate R-E-D-N-E-C-K please come to the front of the restaurant? Finally, this guy steps forward, and his wife. And I'm like, hey, guys, how's it going? I'm like, so um, we were driving in the parking lot, and uh, I struck your vehicle with ours, and there's a little bit of damage, and whew, got off my chest. And so anyways, the, his reaction was literally, hey man, these things happen. Um, enjoy the rest of your trip. We'll get it figured out. We'll, uh, we'll deal with it. And I was just blown away because his reaction to me had been so full of grace, so undeserving on my part, and yet he relieved me of all responsibility. Sometimes as amazing as it is to receive grace, it actually isn't that terribly hard to extend it to family, to friends, to those who present as deserving people. But what about those who don't? The ones who don't have it together. The misfits, the unattractive, the homeless, the addicted, the criminals. Do we show grace the same to these people? Does it roll off our tongues with elegance? What about Darius Sessoms? Do you recognize that name? Three days ago in North Carolina, he walked up to a five-year-old boy 
who was playing with his toys in the backyard. And he shot him in the face. He died instantly. He didn't know him. The boy did nothing. Simmons just walked up to him and shot him in the head. Where does grace fit in? Don't get me wrong, because I believe in justice. My whole job is based on justice. But where does grace fit in? How do we approach this man who did such a horrendous thing? Most of us would look at him as a monster. But aren't we all in the same boat at the foot of the cross? Weren't all of us lost in monstrous sin? If our sins that Jesus took upon himself were visible, I mean, if you could visibly see each and every sin that Jesus took on, because at some point my sin, your sin, it was specifically accounted for on that cross. But I see it like, like a label, like, like a movie credits rolling down the screen. The sins of Brent Bruce, lies, deceit, lust, unfaithful. And that's just some for me. Experts estimate that between 107 and 108.2 billion people have been born into this world since it began. That's a lot of sins that Jesus took on. And as those credits roll, the names and the sins as Jesus bears the shame and the pain, somewhere in that list is Darius Sessoms. Like it or not, as hard-hitting as it may be to accept, the same grace was given to Darius as it was to us. We were just as lost in our sins with no ranking or bias. A man who was despised by society like Darius Sessoms, the mind of a criminal who only had his own best interest in mind, making choices that were self-serving, trampling down whoever got in his way. Jesus turned to him while they both hung on a cross and seeing his faith, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. This is God's grace. And whenever I attempt to make sense of God's grace in my mind, I'm always brought back to the acronym that I learned as a child. God's riches at Christ's expense. Every good father teaches his son that nothing good in life is free. Nothing good comes without a cost. And then we discover grace. This free gift of grace, so undeserving and still so free, yet there was a cost. Not for us, but for our Father. Grace cost God seeing His Son take on the sin of the world through brutally vicious and barbaric torture of a cross. That's the E of the grace, generated from the suffering for sin. That was Christ's expense. God's grace is the response to our dilemma of desperately needing a Savior. Let's get back to the text. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Here it is. In God's perfect and finite wisdom, he gives us a formula that would take us as sinners, redeem us, and provide a way back to him so that we could live forever with him in heaven. You know when you're playing cards and you get dealt this miserable hand, that's what God had to work with. The cards were not in his favor. I mean, one card would have read perfect creation. 
Yet man sinned because he wanted more. Another card might read, After sin, man commits evil and terrible acts. A third card, man turns his back on God. And instead of wild cards, the rest just say sinner. This hand was a reminder of how undeserving and filthy we are, deserving eternal separation from God. I mean, if this was my hand of cards, I would have thrown it into the middle and called it a misdeal, but not God. He's holding these reminders, these cards that tell man's story of being entangled in sin, and he is filled with love and compassion for his creation. See, God sees us as having had a sin problem that he needed to redeem. And he sees us as important enough to save. And you know, in God-like fashion, he didn't just speak it into place, because he could have. He could have just erased sin by speaking a word, but that wasn't his plan. That wasn't his perfect plan that he had in place since before we existed. He provided a formula, a solution that requires not only him taking action, but a formula that requires us to participate in the process. Otherwise, he would have just created a bunch of robots which did as we were told with no ability to respond. God doesn't need us in order for him to remain God, but he desires for us to respond to the supernatural work of Jesus on the cross who rose again three days later. We are lost because of our sin. And, and people don't like that word. People don't like to hear that they're sinners. I saw a quote on Instagram the other day, and it said, sinners hate a gospel that confronts their sin. That's why they invented one that doesn't. People seeking for some kind of religion or meaning in their lives will often migrate to the religion that never confronts them on their true identity, which is the fact that they are lost in their own sin when they choose to live separately from Jesus. Charles Spurgeon wrote, Too many think lightly of sin, and therefore they think lightly of the Savior. See, in 1 Corinthians 1.18 it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So many people have yet to see their need of a Savior. Yet to acknowledge that they are lost in their sins. They think that everything that we've talked about this far this morning is a bunch of gibberish and for the weak. They refuse to admit that they are sinful people, that we are sinful people. When people have a false understanding of their identity in God. The popular notion is that God accepts good people and rejects bad people. Most people, whether in Christianized countries or those steeped in other religions, even here on Canadian soil, usually operate under the idea that God accepts or rejects people based on some level of goodness and or religious performance. People operate in this thinking and they base their entire lives after death around it. The whole book of Ephesians blows this theory apart. Many that I've talked to, friends and family members, think that they will get to heaven if they're just morally good people. Many of them believe they are accomplishing these things. Who would want to admit they had sin if the criteria to enter heaven was based on your good works. I mean, admitting they were sinful 
would be acknowledging that they were not going to heaven, and this is very hard for someone to admit who's motivated by good works. If this is your mindset this morning, there's no other way to say it except that you have been led astray. The Bible says in Isaiah 53 that we have all gone astray. We have all turned to our own paths. The path of good works is a dead end. And the good news in the rest of this verse is that the Lord has taken our wrong paths. Everything that we did along the path that led away from him was taken and laid upon his son. We all sin and we all fall short of the glory of God, as Romans 3.23 reminds us. Whether we follow Jesus or not, we still struggle with sin in our lives. There's a reason for this. We don't just sin because we have nothing better to do. It was born into us. It is innate in us because all men, women, and children alike have a sin problem. The reason why nobody has to tell a baby how to sin is because they know how to do it. We inherited a sin nature from when sin entered the world through Adam and Eve. No created human being is exempt from this inheritance, whether we like it or not. Sinning means missing the mark. We are stained with the mark of sin when we are born into this world. Until Christ returns, we will have to daily fight off the temptation of sin. We can only control what we do through the choices we make, and the only way to do that is by pursuing a daily relationship with Jesus. We read his word, we pray, we meditate on it, and we will begin to understand Jesus. Who he was and how he dealt with different situations. Through time spent with him, we will begin to mimic his actions. But on the flip side, if you're trying to fix an area of your life where sin has a hold of you, and you're trying to do that without daily pursuit of Jesus, you will fall again and again and again. Because left to our own will, following self-help books or podcasts on how to be a better you in 12 easy steps, it's never going to bring peace or fulfillment. It's the same dead end every time. Mark Clark, the pastor of Village Churches in BC, says that the way to defeat much of the sin in our lives is that we must love God more than we love the sin. It's so simple, yet it's profound, because when you start thinking about the sin in your life and the things that you are entangled in? Do you truly love God more than those things? Because if you did, perhaps that sin wouldn't have a hold on us. For it is by grace And that is the core message of our Christian faith. Without grace, we have nothing. Without grace, well, without grace, we just are another religion. Without hope, without truth. Grace was the catalyst that leads to Jesus fulfilling every prophecy that was ever made about him. And that is what separates us from other religions and beliefs. John 1.14 says, The word became flesh, and dwelt among us. The only way that we can have hope in a dark world is because the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The only way that we can have life and hope is because the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Do you understand that the Incarnation is the greatest picture of empathy? People want to know, how can we change what's going on in the world? We need empathy, and that's what Jesus Christ did in his incarnation. He understood that he could not redeem us from heaven. He had to put on human skin and feel what we feel and know what we go through. So the word became flesh, and it dwelt among us. 
Thank God for a Savior who can feel what I feel and know what I go through and can understand when we're crying at night because we're seeing senseless murders. One who can understand why tears come down our faces because sometimes we just don't want to lift our hands in worship or be part of worship. He knows what it feels like to have hurt and pain, so the Word became flesh and it dwelt among us. There's an evangelist who travels the world uh, named Robert Madu. And he has brought uh, some incredible insight for me into some different passages within the Word. And he says this, he says, if I'm sick, please don't just throw me a medical book. Get me a doctor. You know why? Because that doctor personifies the principles that are in that medical book. If I'm in trouble with the law, please don't just give me a law book. Give me a lawyer. You know why? Because that lawyer personifies the principles that are within the law book. And if I'm about to lose my mind, please don't give me a book on psychology. Give me a psychologist. Because the psychologist is going to personify the principles that are in the psychology book. Do you understand that when humanity was lost in our sin, when we had no hope of redemption, we needed more than just the law. We needed more than the Ten Commandments. We needed Jesus. Because Jesus personifies the principles in the Word of God. He is the Word made flesh, and He made His dwelling among us. That's what empathy is. It's the Word becoming flesh. He knew He could not redeem us and be removed from us. He had to come to where we were, and He put on human skin, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Verse 8 says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. The Word says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is our anchor. No one just throws an anchor overboard into the sea. You'd lose it. The anchor must be attached to something, and that something is Jesus. And the authority of his word, the authority of who Jesus is, the power that comes from Jesus, and to know that Jesus has the final say. If your faith is not connected to his authority, you may have some problems. The last two words of verse 8 gives us the activator to grace. Through faith, faith activates the grace. Faith is to grace what yeast is to bread. It activates the ingredients to rise and create a beautiful loaf of bread. Without the yeast, the bread is like a brick, as many commented on the internet. You cannot achieve the end result, which is a usable, edible loaf of bread when not activated by yeast. Grace on its own is beautiful. However, it does not achieve the end result of salvation if it's not activated by our faith. And God doesn't force His faith on anyone. Faith is an action or response to the grace that we must all individually take. If grace equaled salvation without the need for us to respond in faith, then just everyone would be saved. The grace would be the only piece of the formula that was needed. Yet we know that it is grace plus faith that equals salvation. As one commentary states it, on the part of God, salvation is by grace. On the part of man, it is through faith. It does not come to us by an involuntary act as light falls on our eyes, sounds on our ears, or air enters our lungs. When we are so far enlightened as to understand about it, there must be a personal reception of salvation by us 
and that is by faith. Have you ever noticed that God loves to meet us halfway in many of life's challenges? I mean, look at this sermon. Look at people who preach the Word. God uses people and sends them out to preach His Word, and then He does the supernatural work of bringing them to Him, of changing their hearts, because we can't do that. There's no part that we play with, with God where we can change somebody's heart. That's God's part. He often carries out the supernatural part, the miraculous part of the process as he waits for us to respond in obedience. I'm not saying that these are necessarily equal parts because we are human and he is all-knowing and all-powerful and all-perfect. But for us to understand this concept, we need to consider the saying that he wants to meet us halfway. The salvation verse in Ephesians provides the supernatural grace and then requires for us to react in faith. There is story after story in the Bible where God works in partnership with us. David swung his sling around and around, propelling the rock through the air. But God supernaturally struck Goliath in the exact spot that would take him down. On top of that, David still had to cut off Goliath's head, which was further action on his part. Samson, with God's supernatural strength, killed many Philistines. Moses took action with his staff while God supernaturally parted the Red Sea and produced water from a rock. The list goes on and on with examples of God partnering with us. Is it because he needs us to carry out the task? Of course not. He could just speak it into place. But I believe that the main reason in many cases is to see if we will be obedient, to see where our faith is. Think of times in your own life when God required you to take action. Times where he provided the way, but you had to walk into it. You had to step into it and take action. When you looked back, you saw how he had worked so amazingly through that situation. I remember uh, when I was... First applying to Lethbridge Police, I was with Blood Tribe Police at the time, and one of the, one of the um, physical tests was called the beep test. And I don't know if you guys have ever run it. My kids act like it's the easiest thing in the world. When you look like me and you're my age, it's not that easy, okay? People fail it all the time. Um, but I remember training for this thing, and I remember I knew exactly what it was. I knew exactly what the test entailed. It was just whether I could get my body to perform that day. It was whether I could actually meet the criteria that needed to be met in order for me to pass the test. And I remember running it. And if you don't know about it, basically, um, you have a, a set distance, and you have to get from point A to point B within the beep. Sounds easy, right? So it's like... Beep, I'm there. Run some more. Beep, I'm at the line. Run some more. Beep, 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 beep. I'm, I'm hitting it. But I'm getting to the point where I know that my body's going to hit exhaustion and a point where I, I've actually never really gotten past that before and I was nervous. And it was at like six or seven where, or eight and I'm like, God, I can't continue. I, I just, I have nothing left in me so if this is your will, if this is, if Lethbridge is what you want for my life, if that's what you want for our family, then I need your help. And I don't remember anything else. I don't remember the last uh, four or five laps or segments. I just remember sitting down and they were like, you passed. And I'm like, really? And I believe that in that moment that God did something very special in my life. 
but I still had to be the one who ran it. I still had to take the action of going through the process. There's countless true stories of heroes of our faith who came before us and gave us examples to live by and to learn from. And I've already named a few, but let's consider Jacob who wrestled with God and found him new faith. The sinful woman who broke a jar of expensive perfume over Jesus' feet, scorned by the Pharisees. And Jesus said, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. We have Esther, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, and so many more. And then there's those who Jesus brought healing to and actually directly addresses their faith. The Roman officer in Matthew 8 who knew that by speaking the word right where they were standing, miles from home, far from his servant who was in tormenting pain, this Roman soldier had faith to believe that all Jesus had to do was command it and it would be done. Jesus told him he had not seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. But the story that I want to focus most on in regards to faith is Mark 5, 25 to 34, which we read this morning. It's a merging of two stories, two characters that are connected, but on the outside appear very disconnected. Our characters are Jairus, a synagogue leader, and an unnamed woman who had an issue of bleeding for 12 years. There's many differences upon first unveiling the text. Jairus is a man. The woman is a woman. Jairus is named in the text. The woman doesn't even have a name. Jairus is a ruler in the synagogue. And this woman can't even come near the synagogue because of her sickness as it has made her ceremonial unclean, ceremonially unclean. The culture would suggest that Jairus was affluent, probably had some money in the bank. This woman, on the other hand, was broke, and she had spent all that she had and was still sick. I mean, Jairus, he was like a, a six-mile creek type living in Lethbridge, where this woman was more of the north side, where I work. Not all the north side, okay? I would live on the north side, but it has that reputation. They had nothing in common on the surface, but life had put them both in the exact same place and position because they both had been hit with something that they could not handle. Life has a way of doing that, of evening the playing field. Life has a way of smacking us upside the head with stuff that money can't fix. Your friends or your family can't fix. I mean, it's, it's happening right now with, with this whole pandemic. Life has a way of taking your breath away. And if that's you today, if life has given you something that you can't handle, then that means that it's a thing for Jesus. It's a job for Jesus. Nothing in common, but life brought them into the same position of having to push people out of the way to get to Jesus. You know, I remember being in marketplaces in Toronto um, and bigger city centers, and, and people would literally push you out of the way to get what they wanted. I remember going to grab an item at this flea market, and this, this lady literally pushes past me and grabs the item out of my hand. You snooze, you lose, I guess, is the name of the game. But Jairus and this woman had to maneuver the crowds just to get an appointment with Jesus. There was no laid out path or meeting time. It was two people desperate to meet with Jesus. And desperate people can do desperate things. Isn't it true that when we are desperate for God to meet a need, we approach him differently? When we are desperate for God, we don't care what others think. We might even lift our hands in worship, ignoring the uncomfortableness that it once brought 
We're praying three times a day. We're getting on our knees. See, God did not send this pandemic, but he's certainly using it. Using it to wake up his church to become desperate for him. Desperate to see our family members saved. Desperate for the bride of Christ, the church, to wake up and desire God with every strand of DNA that's in them. Desperate to regain the relationship that he intended for us to have with him. It was this desperation that brought Jairus and this woman together at the feet of Jesus. Now, as different as they may look, they actually have some things in common. Again, Robert Madu uh, speaks on this topic, and he says, Jairus, who arrives first, is desperate for Jesus to come to his house where his 12-year-old daughter is dying. The woman fights through the crowd and arrives after having suffered with illness for 12 years. See the connection? The year that Jairus' daughter was born is the same year that the illness started in this woman. Now imagine if they had hospitals. Picture Jairus and his wife and the newborn baby. They're leaving the hospital with joy and expectation of raising this child. And right behind them is this woman leaving in tears because she just got diagnosed with an illness that they didn't know how to fix. And 12 years later, they stand before Jesus looking for answers. Was it the amount of faith that they had that healed them? Scholars will debate about this one till the end of time. Madhu put it this way, the Bible says to have faith like a mustard seed. It's not about the size of your faith, but rather the object of your faith. When your faith is connected to a biblical awareness of Jesus' authority, when his authority, his deity, the things that make Jesus who he is, when that is the object of your faith, you will see your faith grow. Remember when the disciples were on the boat and the winds picked up and the waves started getting crazy? Everyone started freaking out and wondering what to do. And Jesus, well, Jesus was at the bottom of the boat, just sound asleep. And the disciples wake him up and they're like, Jesus, don't you care? We're about to die. Jesus gets up, calm, cool, and collected. He goes to the side of the bow and he says, peace, be still. And in an instant, the wind and the waves were still. And the disciples drop their jaw and they go, who is this man? Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? And what does Jesus say back to them? How is it that you have no faith? You know why you're shocked? Because you didn't know how much authority I had. You didn't know who I really was. You should have looked at me while I was asleep on the boat and said, who is this man that is sleeping and snoring in the middle of a hurricane? If this storm isn't bothering him, it's not going to bother me. Because if you're not stressed about the situation, then why should I be stressed about the situation? Oh, how much easier things would be if we trusted his authority. If we truly understood the power of Jesus. Many of us don't have a faith problem, but we have an awareness of his authority problem. Jairus got a house call from Jesus because that was his awareness of his authority. Jairus was like, Jesus, um, sorry, Jesus, please, if you could just come to my house. My, my daughter, she's about to die, so I just need you to come to my house and lay hands on her so that she will be healed. So Jesus is like, you want me to come to your house? Okay, I'll, I'll come to your house, and, and they get going. This woman, though, this woman had a whole 
another level of awareness of Jesus' authority. She was like, Jesus, you don't need to come to my house. I don't have time for that. All I have to do is touch the hem of your garment. If I touch the hem of your garment, I just know that I will be made whole. And that's what she got. We don't have a faith problem, but we are unaware of his authority. If you don't believe that someone has the ultimate authority, then you will doubt the the validity of their words. He says, I am the word. He is the God of heaven and earth. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. He spoke the world into existence. He is the God of authority. Getting back to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we read, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And I like the Amplified Version, which expands it to read, not as a result of your works, nor your attempts to keep the law, so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for his salvation. This piece of this concept, this piece of text is so important. See, in Paul's day and age, the Pharisees were trapped in religious works, and they were all about keeping the law. They believed that salvation was based on their performance, and yet they rejected Jesus when he showed up in their region. Jesus walked amongst them and was soon to change everything fulfill a promise of a Messiah, and yet they were too blind to see it. Let's not be blind to this miraculous grace that God poured out on us, blind to the fact that nothing we can do, no amount of extra volunteering or giving or praying or even reading the Bible can dictate whether or not we are saved. How often, though, we get caught in this trap of performance, Believing believing either consciously or unconsciously that the better we behave, the better our appearances on the outside, the more saved we feel. No amount of performance changes whether you are saved or not. His grace is not performance-based. We work in church, we help with ministry as a result to loving our God. He loves that we want to further his kingdom. Just don't think that you're winning salvation points because it has nothing to do with salvation. Grace and faith equal salvation. God the Father sent his Son to earth to complete the supernatural act of death and resurrection. This was his grace on an undeserving human race who chose sin over him. His grace was undeserved and he knew that, but despite how much his children disobeyed him, he carried out his plan of grace. It's difficult as parents to always extend grace to our children. We pour into their lives, into training them and loving them. And they disappoint us at times, and it's hard to show them grace. There's not anything our children can do to hurt us or disobey us that comes close to the betrayal and disobedience that mankind showed towards God, and yet he loved us so dearly that he would sacrifice his son, whom he also loved dearly. What will you do with this grace today? It's a completed project. It requires no further updates or additions. All that is needed is to respond in faith, to accept the Son Jesus who shed his blood for you. There is salvation in none other. The Gospels tell us that no one comes to the Father, except through me, through Jesus. And that is his grace. Let's pray.
Lord God, I thank you again that we can gather together, Lord. I just, Lord, I pray that although um, we're so aware of your grace and the fact that it takes faith, and maybe there's some people, Lord, that are here or that are listening that have heard this grace story for the first time, Lord, speak to them in a, in a special way. May your spirit just move in their hearts. And Lord, for those of us who have heard this, these words used so often in our walk with you, Lord, bring new meaning, bring deeper understanding of exactly what your grace meant to us. Because Lord, we know that if we truly understand your grace, how can we walk away from that? Lord, be with us for the rest of this week. Bless the rest of our activities today. And Lord, uh, be with Pastor Kevin and his family. Lord, give them rest. Lord, just help them to be able to uh, come back uh, rejuvenated and ready to continue their ministry, Father God. I thank you so much for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks very much, Brent. I can invite you to stand as we close our service this morning. Says the honey sweet. So you love this city and you love these streets. Every child out playing on their own front door. Every baby lying on the bedroom floor. Every dreamer dreaming at the dead end job. Driver driving through a rush hour mall. I feel it in my spirit, feel it in my bones. You're gonna send revival, bring them all back home. For I can hear the thunder in the distance, like a train on the edge of the town. I can feel the burning of your spirit.
Dear loving God, thank you so much for the words that you brought us this morning through Brent. Thank you for the time that we're able to gather and as we go through these doors, just help us to be an impact. Just build that into us as you've built into so many different people, situations, and what you bring to the table every day through us. We thank you for this and we just, uh, yeah, just pray for the health and wellness of everybody around us as we continue and we pray it in your precious name. Amen. We're going to invite you as we dismiss this morning, just to respect, we're going to have the door open over here, uh, just so we don't all funnel around, uh, right out into the aisle here. Uh, just, you know, just keep your distance as we exit those doors this morning. Feel free to congregate uh, yeah, out, in the, out in the parking lot or wherever you see fit this morning. God bless. Have a great, great week.